experts in this field uh, talking to us. So I'm sure they are going to be very happy to answer all of your questions. So during the presentation and in the end, please type all of your questions on the Q&A chat box. And I'm sure all of them are going to be very happy to answer in the end of uh, this combined session. Just remind you about some activities we are having every a month still. Uh, these hands-on uh, surgical training. So if you're a surgeon, it's a great opportunity to learn with a 3D printing model. So this is very nice. It's hosted by uh, 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 colleagues from uh, Sick Kids in Toronto and Congenital Heart Academy is the co-host. Sasha is one of the proctors. So this is a great activity. So if you're a surgeon, it's something that's going to be very nice for you to practice. And I think we have all of the sessions already uploaded on our YouTube channel. So take your time to take a look. Uh, we have 10 uh, interesting sessions about the history of pediatric cardiology. Take a look on our YouTube channel. They are very, very interesting. And this is something that is making us uh, very happy. As all of you know, unfortunately, Dr. Gary Webb passed away uh, last month and we are going to have a journal club uh, uh, on his honor. And we are going to have our first uh, uh, talk, our first paper is going to be about risk factors for failed Fontan procedure falling uh, second stage palliation. So this is a very nice uh, paper published this year by colleagues from Germany. And uh, we are going to present you a summary of the paper. Then the, the author of the paper is going to highlight his findings. We are going to have a panel of uh, specialists in this area to discuss, and we are going to have we are going to be happy to welcome all of you for you to comment, to make questions about the paper and about this very uh, interesting uh, topic. Another thing that I want to ask all of you is that if you have a specific paper that you think is going to be suitable for us to discuss in this journal club, please email me. Mail the uh, and the email where you receive the, uh, the link for this uh, webinar, just reply on this email uh, telling me which uh, uh, paper do you think is going to be interesting. Then we can uh, uh, choose this, um, this paper to discuss. This is going to be activity that you're going to have every month. And I'm sure this is going to be a, a very good to all of us to learn more uh, about uh, interesting topics. And and please join us in the end of this month. Uh, these are going to be three uh, very uh, close friends of mine. Uh, they are going to talk uh, about uh, uh, interesting topics on fetal cardiology. Dr. Rima is the organizer of this nice activity. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be awesome. So if you're interested in fetal cardiology, uh, please join us on the 25th. And now, uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Anderson is going to talk to us about what we should expect from the session today. And just remind you guys, on December the 3rd and on December the 17th, we are going to have the continuation of this uh, first part of this series. So now with you, uh, Dr. Anderson, thank you very much, Dr. Anderson, for doing this uh, for us, and Diane and Adrian and Justin for being with us on this series. And um, this, this is going to be amazing. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you very much, Grace. I just want to say a few words to everybody before we start today's presentation. I think everybody will be pleased to see that I'm back in my sitting room. Last year week, as you know, I had a little kerfuffle with my email, but uh, now the web is linked up again and I am sitting in my sitting room, as Grace said, at the end of the presentation. I will be ready, as will my colleagues, to answer any questions you may have. But I just want to say a few words about what we're going to see today. Grace has already told you that we have three sessions now that are going to lead us up to Christmas. And what we're trying to do now is to link everything that we have done with development to morphology. And I'm going to be taking a back seat in these presentations. In fact, I've not seen the full presentation that we're going to look at today. I've introduced it, as everyone will see, but the work is now being done by Diane, who is presenting the videos of hearts. And we're joined by Justin, who presents CT images. Today, we hope at the end of the session, Adrian will join us, but that might not be possible because I know he's working hard in the intensive care unit at the moment. If all goes well, Adrian will join us. But Sasha has put all of this together 
to produce the continuous narration that you're all going to see very shortly. I'm grateful for Sasha for all the work he's done, but I'm particularly grateful for all the efforts that Diane and Justin have made to put all of this together. And this, if you all like it, this is going to be the way forward because we're going to try to do the same thing with our next two sessions in the lead up to Christmas. We're going to try to link the developmental information with the anatomical information. And then if all goes well, when we continue our sessions next year, we will be doing the same thing. I will be putting the developmental parts. Hopefully Diane will be matching that with morphology and Justin and Adrian will be continuing that to take us into the clinical setting. So Sasha, let's start the video and let's see our introduction to basic anatomy. Well, good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to start three sessions in which we are going to be discussing clinical cardiac anatomy. And I hope that over the course of these three sessions, we can permit you, as you see on the screen, to understand the heart. And what we're going to be trying to do, is going to be trying to put the anatomic findings in the context that they are meaningful for you as clinicians, either for the surgeon or for the cardiologists. Now, those of you who have been with us in this latest season will know that for the past four sessions, we've been discussing cardiac development. And one of the things that we're going to try to do when we discuss cardiac anatomy is to put the anatomical features into the context of the developmental features that you've been looking at over the past few weeks. Now, you will note that all the time, I've been talking about we, because this is going to be very much a joint effort. Most of the dissections that you see will be produced by Diane. Those of you who were here last year will know well the works of Diane. Diane, although not widely appreciated, is a pathologist's assistant. I first met Diane when I worked in Pittsburgh way back in 1982. Since then, she's moved to Florida. And as you all know, she's now a consummate anatomist in her own right. And over the last year, she's now achieved what she deserves, namely an academic appointment. And that appointment is at the All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg in Florida, which is associated with Johns Hopkins University. So Diane is going to be sharing her experience now with us from All Children's Hospital. We're also going to be joined by Justin Tretter. Now Diane and I have known Justin also for quite some time since he was a medical student. He trained in Grenada in the West Indies, but he subsequently returned to the United States and he trained in imaging first in New York. Then he did a fellowship in Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and he is now one of the major imagers at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And Justin is going to be joining us to share with us all the information that we can now get from computed tomography. And then hopefully to conclude all our sessions, we're going to be joined by Adrian Krushan. Adrian is a surgeon and I've known Adrian for quite some time. He's from Romania initially, but I first met Adrian when he came to Great Ormond, Ch Great Ormond Children's Hospital in London whilst I was still working there. He's since done a PhD in surgery, he's done a PhD in statistics, and now he is in charge of the archive at Birmingham Children's Hospital. And he and I have been working over the past five or seven years to put this archive back into working use. And Adrian, like Diane, has become a consummate anatomist in his own right. And he's going to be reinforcing what we say during our presentations by giving live demonstrations at the end of each sessions. So let's get going with clinical cardiac 
anatomy. Now you will all be well aware that over the years it's been accepted that the gold standard for understanding anatomy has come from dissecting room. And that is because when we are in the dissecting room, we have the heart in our hands, we can turn it, we can open it, we can show the features in which you might be interested. And that is what Diane is going to be doing over this and the subsequent lectures. But now we have a new gold standard, and that is multi-detector computed tomography. The huge advantage of multi-detector computed tomography is it puts the heart back into the body. And this is what Justin is going to be sharing with us. Justin is going to be bringing forward virtual dissections. It's going to show us the cardiac anatomy in the context of the body. And of course, that is how you understand it. And what we're going to try to do is combine these features together. But in today's presentation, we're going to concentrate on the basic features. We are going to set the ground rules, which we will then amplify over the next two sessions prior to Christmas. And we're going to start by emphasizing the importance of attitudinal descriptions. We're then going to emphasize again, perhaps the most important feature of clinical cardiac anatomy. And that is the principle we call the morphological method. And on the basis of our attitudinal descriptions and the morphological method, we're then going to consider how we recognize the chambers and how we distinguish between them. And that's what we're going to do in this first of our sessions, which is the introductory session. In the next session, which will take place in two weeks time, we're going to take these principles and we're going to use them to examine the atrial chambers and we're going to look at the atrioventricular junctions. Then in our final session, which will take place just before Christmas, if all goes according to plan, we're going to look at the ventricular mass and we're going to look at the arrangement of the valves how they sit in the ventricle and hopefully give you all you need to know about ventricular anatomy. But we need some basic rules. And of these rules, the first and most important is the one that all of you learn when you first enter the dissecting room. Because the thing we tell everybody when we are teaching them dissection and we are teaching them to understand the <coughs> organs or the components of the body is that we should describe all of these components as they sit within the body and you will all know we have this situation called the anatomical position where the subject is standing upright and is facing you so you see the right side of the individual to your left hand you see the left side of the individual to your right hand. And describing structures in this context of the anatomical position should be how we take care of everything. And that of course means the heart is no exception. And we should be describing cardiac structures within the context of the bodily coordinates. But for reasons that escaped me for years, anatomists, myself included, have ignored this first basic rule of human anatomy. So let me illustrate what I mean. You will all recognize this. It is the straight chest radiograph. And you all know that you will put it on the box, you will look at it, and when you see this, you know, as I say, that the subject has been taken in the anatomical position. So the right side of the chest, you see to your left hand. The left side of the chest, you see to your right hand. The top is at the top. The head is at the top. The feet are at the bottom. Now, when we put the heart back into the chest, we should put it back like that. So that it sits, as you know, with the apex beat pointing down to the left, with a skew relative to the long axis of the body. 
but we have a problem because for centuries anatomists have been putting the heart back into the body in this fashion and this is what we call the valentine arrangement and this is only seen when we take the heart out of the body and we turn it so that it sits on its apex and only then do the atrial chambers sit directly above the ventricular chambers and only in this valentine arrangement are the so-called right-sided chambers truly to the right of their left-sided counterparts but this is not how you see the heart within the patient when the patient confronts you either for diagnosis or in the operating room so what we need to do is when we describe the heart as you see here seen in left anterior oblique projection despite the fact that we're looking at left anterior oblique projection we should be describing the heart relative to the orthogonal bodily coordinates and there are three such coordinates one goes from side to side and that of course is the plane that gives us the right side the left side and we can call this the frontal plane the next plane within the body goes from the head to the feet and so the top of this plane is what in anatomy we call superior the bottom is what we call inferior and then of course we have the third orthogonal plane and that runs from the front to the back and the back we call posterior we'll know that that is the part that is closest to the spine the front is anterior and that is the part that is closest to the sternum and we should be describing the heart relative to these bodily coordinates and nowadays we are able to do that with total accuracy because we can now see these cardiac structures with multi-detector computed tomography now, as i've emphasized justin is going to be telling us about this but i was very fortunate when i worked in charleston to court to collaborate with Tony Lavarchek. And Tony is a wizard at using computed tomography. So here you see he's taken this cut, which is the left anterior oblique projection. But the beauty of computed tomography is there in the corner of the image. You see the coordinates that tell you exactly how you are looking at the section. But we can go more than that because you see at the borders of the image we have the coordinates so there is p posterior and that tells us that that is the posterior part of the section opposite that obviously we have a anterior this is the sternocostal surface of the heart and it is anterior and then to the top we have h standing for head and this is the superior part and here is the key point the fourth border is labeled F for feet, and that is the part that is inferior. And this is the part that gets confused when we take the heart out and we show it in Valentine rather than attitudinal orientation. Now, this is particularly important when we show the coronary arteries. And here is a reconstruction of the coronary arteries from a computed tomographic data set. It's been made by another close friend and colleague of mine, Shompei Mori, initially from Kobe in Japan, now working in Los Angeles. And it was Shompei who taught Justin how to interrogate his own virtual data sets and how to provide his virtual dissections that you're going to see very shortly. So in Shompei's reconstruction, there you see the anterior interventricular artery. And this is a reasonable name for this artery. But facing it, we have a second artery. And this is the artery that perhaps suffers most when we use Valentine rather than attitudinal description. Because as you clearly see, this artery is irrigating the diaphragmatic surface of the heart that is closest to the feet. And it is the inferior interventricular artery 
I'm sure most of you will still call this the posterior descending artery, but it is not posterior. And if you look at its trajectory, you see that it is primarily horizontal and it might even be ascending as it moves to reach the cardiac apex. And this shows us the importance of using attitudinal determination. And this is now what Diane is going to show you. It's easy to observe the first rule of anatomy when the heart remains within the chest or attached to the lungs as I have here. And that first rule of anatomy is that we should describe all of the bodily structures as they appear within the body and relative to the bodily coordinates. So here is the long axis of the body, which my probe is running uh, parallel with the spine, and the long axis of the heart is at about a 45 degree angle to the spine. And the long axis of the heart runs from posterior right to anterior left. So why then do we take the heart out and train our medical trainees with the heart in the valentine position. So with the apex pointing downwards, that leaves us with the right ventricle and the left ventricle. When we place the heart back in the body and in anatomic position or attitudinally appropriate position, we end up with the right ventricle in anterior position relative to the left ventricle, which is posterior. And this surface marks the diaphragmatic surface so that along the diaphragmatic surface in the valentine position, this now becomes the posterior aspect. This artery that runs along the inferior portion of the interventricular septum is currently referred to as the posterior descending coronary artery. And if we place the heart back in anatomic position, this artery lies against the diaphragm, which I've marked with my finger, and it should be called the inferior interventricular coronary artery. If we look at the heart on short axis, we can now see the position of the heart so that the diaphragm is at the bottom of the screen along my probe. The sternocostal aspect extends anterior to superior and the posterior aspect is here. On the sternocostal border running from anterior to superior, we can see the right ventricular outflow tract wrapping around the aortic root, which is forming the centerpiece of the heart. The atrioventricular valves also can be described by their anatomic position so that the tricuspid valve with its three leaflets has the largest leaflet in anterior superior position with the anterior papillary muscle supporting it. The inferior leaflet lies closest to the diaphragmatic aspect of the heart and it is the smallest of the three leaflets and often has variable papillary muscle support as we have here. The septal leaflet lies along the septum and it is supported by multiple septal attachments along with the zone of apposition between the anterior superior leaflet and the septal leaflet supported by the medial papillary muscle. The mitral valve has two papillary muscle groups that in valentine position are actually incorrectly referred to. This papillary muscle group is inferior and anterior relative to the anatomic position of the heart when in valentine position it was called the posterior medial papillary muscle. The other papillary muscle is superior and posterior when in valentine position it is called anterior and lateral. If we look at the bifoliate nature of the mitral valve you can see that both papillary muscles equally support each of the leaflets. So now we know that when we describe the heart we have to describe it relative to the bodily coordinates. But we also need to understand it, and we need to understand it whether it's normal, as we're going to see in these three sessions, or whether it's congenitally malformed. And we're going to take the principles we established today, next year, when we look at congenitally malformed hearts. 
And you all know now that if we are to make an accurate diagnosis, we need to approach the heart in sequential segmental fashion. So we need to establish what is going on in the atrial chambers. We need to know what's happening within the ventricular mass. We need to look at the arterial trunks. And when we know the arrangements of those so-called segments, we can look at the junctions between them. But if we are to do that, then we need to know how to distinguish between the components in these chambers. And this is where we come to this key principle, the so-called morphological method. Now, I've talked about this on several occasions previously with you, and I've emphasized to you how it was introduced by my good friend Richard Van Prague when he criticized rightly one of our own presentations. And that was when we were trying to disqualify a chamber in the heart from ventricular status. And Richard pointed to the fallacy at the time of our approach because we were trying to use one feature that was variable, ventricular inlet, so as to diagnose the ventricle itself. And Richard rightly pointed to the fallacy in this approach. And what he said, we should use the most constant component of any chamber for definition. So Diane now is going to show you the problems that exist when you seek to use an, a variable feature to try to define the, the nature of a given structure, in this instance, the atrial chambers. The morphologic method states that you cannot use one variable feature to describe another feature which is itself variable. And we all associate the pulmonary veins as a normal structure draining into the roof of the left atrium. Well, if I lift the heart from its pericardial cradle, and this is called the Tausig maneuver, you'll see that the left lung does not move, and we can demonstrate that there is no attachment between the left atrium and the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins are variable structures, so we cannot use them as a morphologic determinant for the left atrium. Here we can see the left atrium is morphologically normal with its tubular appendage and its narrow junction to the venous component. The atrial vestibule is entirely smooth and the pectinate muscles are confined to the appendage. And there's the coronary sinus in the left atrioventricular groove. If I lift the heart from its pericardial cradle, you can see the right and left pulmonary veins joining in a confluence behind the heart. There is a vertical vein that extends between the pulmonary arteries, also between the aortic arch and the arterial duct, where there's a significantly stenotic area but this vertical vein then drains into the left brachiocephalic vein and the pulmonary venous flow is coming into the right atrium. If we use the pulmonary veins as our morphologic determinant, we would have to call this morphologically right atrium the left atrium. Here we can see the pectinate muscles extending around the right atrioventricular junction, and this is clearly a morphologically right atrium. This specimen will again demonstrate the morphologic method where we cannot use our pulmonary and systemic venous connections as our atrial morphologic determinant. Here we have a heart that has bilateral morphologically left atrial appendages. This is the left-sided appendage. And here you can see there's partial anomalous pulmonary venous return of the left upper pulmonary vein to the coronary sinus. The right-sided morphologically left atrium is hemodynamically dilated, but still has a tubular appendage and a narrow junction with the venous component. The floor of the atrium admits the hepatic veins and the roof, the superior cable vein, with a very large azagous vein. The atrial appendage 
reveals the pectinate muscles confined to the appendage and the remainder of the atrium has a smooth vestibule with the coronary sinus here. When we look at the azagous vein, you can see it runs parallel with the descending aorta, extends over the root of the right lung, and drains the venous drainage from the abdomen. Looking at the posterior aspect of the liver, you can see that there is no fossa present for the inferior cable vein, so that the hepatic segment is interrupted. So the morphologically left atrium on the right side, even though it admits the superior cable vein to its roof, cannot be judged as a morphologically right atrial appendage. It clearly has the pectinate muscles confined to the appendage, a smooth atrial vestibule, a coronary sinus, and there's a prominent venous valve that partially covers the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa. So Diane has shown you that we need to know which part of any given segment we should use for definition. So that follows, we need to know the components of each segment. And we've started off by looking at the atrial chambers and Diane has now shown you that the venous component is not suitable for distinguishing between right and left morphology. From what we learned about development, we know that there is a body, but we're going to see very shortly that it's hard to recognize the body. The atrial chambers have vestibules, and you know that they are the initial atrioventricular canal myocardium, and they don't distinguish the two atrial chambers. The septum separates the chambers. It's not nearly as big as we think, thought it was. It does have features, but it's not always present, so we can't use the septum. Then there is the appendage. So let's look at how we find these component parts within the atrial chambers. And again, Diane is going to show us the components of the atrial chambers. The atriums have five components, and we'll begin with, on the right with the appendage. So we know the right appendage has a blunt or triangular tip, and the anterior aspect makes up the entire extent of the right atrial appendage. It also has a broad attachment with the venous component, and here you can see I'm placing my probe in the superior and inferior cable veins. And within the atrium, the venous component is actually quite smooth. Another smooth area within the right atrium is its vestibule, and the vestibule extends circumferentially around the atrioventricular junction and lies between the distal extent of the pectinate muscles and the atrioventricular junction. The body of the right atrium is a relatively small area and pretty nondescript and it is the area between where the inferior cable vein joins the floor of the right atrium and the inferior aspect of the oval fossa. So this area here and in this area sometimes you can see some fenestrations and that's representative of where the left venous valve was resorbed. The atrial septum is a shared component between the atriums and it's composed of the primary portion which is the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa and the second true component of the atrial septum which is the anterior inferior muscular buttress and this anterior inferior muscular rim around the oval fossa. Looking at the left atrium the appendage is a tubular structure with a narrow junction to the um, atrial vestibule and the venous component is made up of the left and right pulmonary veins as they join the roof of the left atrium. Here we see the narrow junction of the appendage as it lies between the atrial vestibule which is entirely smooth in the left atrium and the body of the atrium. The septal structures include 
the left side of the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa, which gives us this characteristic horseshoe appearance where it overlaps the superior interatrial fold. And then the anterior inferior muscular buttress will be located in this area. So you've seen now the components of the atrial chambers. And in fact, the most constant of those components is the appendage. When we use the word appendage, it's as if it's a spare part. But in reality, the appendage is the most constant component. And we've shown in the past that when we take the pectinate muscles relative to the vestibules, we can distinguish chambers on the basis of the pectinate muscles. So now we're going to see how we distinguish the atrial chambers. The extent of the pectinate muscles within the atrial chambers is our morphologic determinant. They also have some characteristic outward appearance relative to their shape and junction with the venous component. So here we see a morphologically right atrial appendage with its blunt or triangular tip, and this entire anterior aspect is composing the appendage. It also has a very broad junction with the venous component. When we open up the right atrial appendage. Here we see this prominent muscle bundle, which lies along that broad venous junction, and this is the terminal crest. And when we look at the extent of the pectinate muscles, you can see that they entirely encircle the right atrioventricular junction. They extend from that terminal crest and all the way around to the crooks of the heart. So here is the coronary sinus. So our right atrial appendage is our pectinated appendage. When we look at the left atrial appendage, we know that it is a tubular structure, often with some scalloping or crenellations along its edge, and there's a very narrow junction with the venous component. The pulmonary veins, left and right, join the venous component or join the left atrium, and here we can see the narrow junction of the appendage with the left atrium. The left atrial vestibule is entirely smooth, and the pectinate muscles are confined to that appendage. Now, you may well say that's all very well when we have the heart in our hands. Time's now shown you how you can use the pectinate muscles when you have the heart in your hands. But what about you as clinicians? Can we distinguish the pectinate muscles in life? Well, we now believe we can using multi-detector computed tomography. So now you're going to see Justin for the first time. And Justin is going to show you how now you can use computed tomographic data sets you can distinguish on the basis of the extent of the pectinate muscles, the morphologically right, and the morphologically left atrium. More importantly, you can distinguish the atrial appendages when they are isomeric. So now Justin is going to show you two clips to illustrate the significance of the pectinate muscles. Thank you, Professor Anderson. So here we're looking at a CT data set of a patient with normal segmental anatomy. And we're starting looking up from the head of the data set. And then as we zoom up and we'll start to dissect into the base of the heart. So there we see the pulmonary and the aortic root. And here we see both the mitral valve and then on the right here in a surgeon's view, we see the tricuspid valve. So because of the contrast opacification timing, we have very heterogeneous opacification into the right atrium, so not as clean of a view. But if we look at the left side and we see this narrow finger-like left atrial appendage with the pectinate muscle extending within the appendage, but as we position it so we can start to view the vestibule, 
we can see that the pectinate muscle is contained within the, the atrial appendage and not extending to the left atrial vestibule. So very smooth wall leading down to the mitral valve. And then as we focus over on the right atrium, again, a little more heterogeneous opacification, so not as clean of a view, but we see this broader base atrial appendage. And as we dissect superiorly into the appendage, you can appreciate the pectinate muscle here near the tip of the appendage. But then as we start to focus at the base of the appendage, leading outside, extending outside of the confines of this broad base right atrial appendage, we see the pectinate muscle coming down to the vestibule near the tricuspid valve within the right atrium. And then as we dissect, so we can focus on the anterior and rightward wall of this right atrial appendage, you can again appreciate this very broad base, relatively larger right atrial appendage with that pectinate muscle extending outside of its confines down to, to the vestibule of the right atrium near the tricuspid valve. And then we'll switch into a, an endocast view. So looking at the, the blood-filled cavities and vessels of the heart. And here we're looking in a right anterior oblique view at the anterior aspect of both the right atrium and the right ventricle. Again, we can appreciate that very broad base right atrial appendage with its base extending from the terminal groove, which is extending between the cable veins. And as we rotate leftward into a left anterior oblique view, we can appreciate this relatively smaller and narrow base or finger-like appendage of the left atrium. In this patient, we'll start anteriorly. So we see the EKG leads on the chest. And then as we start to dissect into the chest, we'll go through some very interesting anatomy that we won't focus on, but here we see the right atrium and, and the right ventricle right under the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve near its commissure with the anterior superior leaflet, we see a perimembranous VSD. Focusing on the right atrium here, we see a large secundum ASD, and we see ipsilateral drainage of the pulmonary veins on either side of this deficient primary atrial septum. But as we start to dissect into a short axis, looking at the base of the heart, Again, we're looking in a surgeon's view. So here on the right is the tricuspid valve. Here on the left is the mitral valve. And we see these dilated atrial appendages. But if we look more closely, we see that both have a more finger-like morphology to them. But more importantly, we see the pectinate muscle here on this left-sided appendage is contained completely within this atrial appendage with a very smooth vestibule leading down to the left-sided AV valve or mitral valve. So that morphologically, this is a left atrial appendage. If we look at the right-sided atrial appendage, which is relatively more dilated, we also see this finger-like morphology to it. But importantly, if we look at the pectinate muscle, um, <clears throat> we can see that the pectinate muscle is contained within the atrial appendage with no extension of the pectinate muscle to the vestibule of this right-sided atrium. So also a morphologically left atrial appendage. So this patient has isomerism of the left atrial appendages. But you're all well aware that even though we can distinguish the pectinate muscles using multi-detected computed tomography, you don't always have access to this diagnostic technique. But there is another means of distinguishing what is morphologically right from what is morphologically left. And that is the presence in the morphologically left atrioventricular junction of a venous channel. So let me show you that because this can be seen by the echocardiographer. So here I've taken a cut across the morphologically left atrioventricular junction of a normal heart. You're seeing the mitral valve. And there within the left atrioventricular junction, you see a venous channel. And you all should know that is the coronary sinus. So here we have another clue as to what is morphologically right and what is morphologically left, because it is only the morphologically left junction that harbors such a venous channel. And even though 
the coronary sinus empties into the right atrium, it is contained within the morphologically left atrioventricular junction. So when you see the venous channel within the atrioventricular junction, you know that the atrial chamber directly adjacent to it is the morphologically left atrium. So another very useful clue to distinguishing between the atrial chambers, because that channel is universally absent when we have isomeric right atrial appendages. Should you find the venous channel in the right-sided junction rather than the left-sided junction, then you know there will be mirror imagery, situs inversus, if you will. The arrangement is variable in the setting of left isomerism, but it is a very useful marker for distinguishing between the atrial chambers. So that's the distinction between the atrial chambers. Let's then move on and let's look at the ventricular segment. Now I have to start by emphasizing it extends from the atrioventricular to the ventricular arterial junctions. Almost always it contains two chambers and those chambers possess an inlet, an apical component and an outlet. And now Diane is going to show you again how we distinguish the extent of the ventricular component and what its components are. Here we're looking at a long axis view of a normal right ventricle where the free wall of the atrium and the ventricle have been removed. The ventricular mass in most cases contains two ventricles and the ventricular mass extends from the atrioventricular junction to the ventriculoarterial junction. Ventricles are typically examined in a tripartite fashion so that they have an inlet which extends from the hinge point of the atrioventricular valve to where that valve attaches to either papillary muscles or the septum. They have an apical trabecular component and an outlet component. If we look at a Similar view of a left ventricle, again, a long axis type of cut. We can see the inlet from the hinge point of the mitral valve to the attachments to the tips of the papillary muscles, the apical trabecular component, and with the aorta in the outlet component. So you've seen that the ventricular mass, each of those chambers within the ventricular mass has three components, the inlet, the apical part, the outlet. We know it is the apical part that is most constant. So now Diane will show you the significance of the ap apical component, but she'll also emphasize that when chambers are normally constituted, you can also take account of those other parts, in particular the inlet part and the arrangement of the atrioventricular valves. And then Justin will take that on and will show you how we can relate that to multi detected computed tomography. Here we're looking at an open right ventricle in attitudinally appropriate fashion. And the ventricles are determined morphologically by their apical trabecular component. Here we see the coarse apical trabecular component that defines a morphologically right ventricle. The tricuspid valve is a morphologically right structure and will always be within the inlet of the right ventricle. It has attachments to the interventricular septum and to papillary muscles. It is also separated from the arterial valve by the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum. The outlet of the right ventricle has the pulmonary valve supported by this complete muscular sleeve. If we look at a morphologically left ventricle, this is roughly a long axis view. And here you can see the morphologic determinant, which is the fine crisscrossing apical trabecular component and the left ventricle typically becomes smooth on the septal surface towards the outlet. The mitral valve is a morphologically left structure and will always travel with the left ventricle. It has only papillary muscle attachments 
and no attachments to the septum. As you can see, the anterior leaflet here is lifted away from the septum and it is in fibrous continuity with the aortic valve. The aortic valve is within the outlet component of the left ventricle. This is the same patient that we looked at with the normal atrial appendages. So now we're starting anteriorly at the anterior chest and we start to dissect in, and here we see the short axis of the ventricles looking from the apices up at the base of the heart. So here we have the morphological left ventricle and the morphological right ventricle. You can appreciate right off the bat the coarser trabeculations, even though this left ventricle is dilated with some hypertrophy, the trabeculations are much more fine, lacy, crisscross trabeculations. On the right side, the, the morphological right ventricle, we also see this moderator band, which is attaching to the free wall of the right ventricle where that anterior papillary muscle is inserting. And as we start to dissect into a right anterior oblique view, so we look at the rightward aspect of the interventricular septum. Again, if you remember this patient has heterogeneous contrast opacification within the right atrium, but here is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And then we can appreciate the inlet, the apical trabecular and the outlet components of the right ventricle. Here is that moderator band coming towards us from the septum to the ventricular free wall, the septal marginal trabeculation coming up, dividing into its anterior cephalid and posterior caudal limbs and at the posterior caudal limb is where we see this important structure, the medial papillary muscle or papillary muscle of Lanchesi, an important landmark for the surgeon where the right bundle branch will emerge along the endocardium of the uh, interventricular septum here. So very um, obvious landmarks of a morphological right ventricle. And as we look at that septal marginal trabeculation, coursing between it and to the free wall or parietal wall are these septoparietal trabeculations that go all the way up into the outflow near the pulmonary valve. So very telling of a morphological right ventricle. And then as we come back over to look at both ventricles in a four chamber view, again, ignoring this heterogeneous contrast opacification, this is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And when we compare it to the attachment of the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve or anterior leaflet, we can see that the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve is more apically positioned. We, we also, again, this patient has severe aortic regurgitation, so a dilated and hypertrophy left ventricle, but the trabeculations are much more fine, lacy, crisscross compared to these coarser trabeculations on the right. And then here, as we go into a three-chamber view, looking at the leftward aspect of the interventricular septum, you can appreciate how much more relatively smooth it is when we view that right side, where the right side had those septoparietal trabeculations. We have no trabeculations leading into the outflow towards the aortic valve. So now we've distinguished between the chambers, the atrial segment, We've looked at the ventricular segment and we've determined how we will distinguish what the morphologically right from morphologically left ventricle. So the third segment, of course, is the arterial segment, and that usually contains two arterial trunks. Now here we come to a problem because there is no direct means of distinguishing between the arterial trunks on their basic anatomical features. But without exception, in my experience, we can distinguish between the trunks according to the way they branch. And on the basis of their pattern of branching, we can distinguish in the normal heart, the aorta, the pulmonary trunk. And when the heart is congenitally malformed, we can distinguish the presence of the common arterial trunk, and we can distinguish that variant where there are no intrapericardial pulmonary arteries, the arrangement that we call the solitary arterial trunk. But today we are concerned with the normal arterial segment. So now Diane is going to show you how we distinguish between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, how we show 
the intrapericardial, the extrapericardial components, and then Justin will put that into the context of the living patient using, for this purpose, computed tomography. The aorta and pulmonary trunk are identified by their branching pattern. The pulmonary trunk and the aorta, in this case, are normally related. The pulmonary trunk will bifurcate to the left main pulmonary artery and to the right main pulmonary artery, which extends posterior to the aorta and the superior cable vein to the root of the right lung. The structure here is now a ligament, but this was the arterial duct. The aorta is identified by its branching pattern, the first branches of which are the coronary arteries, and here we can see the right coronary orifice. The left coronary orifice is here, and it is extending to become the left main coronary artery and run along the septum with the anterior interventricular branch, and the circumflex branch would run in the left atrioventricular groove. Here you can see the right coronary running in the right atrioventricular groove. The remaining branches of the aorta are the brachiocephalic arteries, the first branch of which is the brachiocephalic trunk that bifurcates into the right subclavian and the right carotid. The next branch is the left carotid and the left subclavian with the arch extending over the root of the lung on the left. If we look at our pericardial reflections, and if I replace the left brachiocephalic vein to its normal position, we can see that the pericardial reflection would have come right across this area on the anterior aspect of the aorta. Pulling the aorta forward, here we can see the pericardial reflection continuing down over the front of the superior cable vein and where the right pulmonary artery emerges from the intrapericardial space. There's only a very short portion of the right pulmonary artery within the intrapericardial space. On the opposite side, the pericardial reflection extends over the anterior aspect of the aortic arch across where the arterial duct joins the pulmonary trunk and over this portion of the left main pulmonary artery so that this portion is extra pericardial. The pericardial reflection would extend over the posterior aspect of the left atrium and there is our oblique sinus. Using this same patient with normal segmental anatomy, we're now looking at a fluoroscopic appearing image anteriorly where we see the silhouette of the cardiac mass. And then as we go forward, we'll put the heart back into the chest. So we see the right ventricle position more anteriorly with the left ventricle more posterior and leftward. And then we'll tip to the base of the heart to look at the great arteries. We see that the pulmonary root is positioned anterior and leftward compared to the aortic root. We see their spiraling relationship and we can easily appreciate the bifurcation of the left and the right branch pulmonary arteries with the right pulmonary artery going inferior to the aortic arch, the aortic arch being left-sided. We see the head and neck vessels identifying this as the aortic arch. And then as we look down further, We'll then switch into a virtual dissection. So here we're looking at the aortic root in short axis. We see the three leaflets of the aortic root, and I'm now going to position this into a surgeon's view. So we're going to rotate this all the way around. So now here is the right atrium and the left atrium. We can see the mitral valve with the aortic root wedged in between the AV valves. We can appreciate the coronary arteries, the left main and the right coronary artery and the aortic root is intrapericardial. And then as we start to come up superiorly, here is the pulmonary root, also intrapericardial. And as we start to get into the pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta, we then become extrapericardial. 
and we can start to appreciate the bifurcation of the branch pulmonary arteries into the left and the right branch pulmonary arteries with the right coursing posterior to the ascending aorta and the right superior cable vein. So there we have it. We've now established basic cardiac anatomy. We've stressed the importance of the attitudinal approach. And I hope now you will all be describing the cardiac components as you see them in the living patient when the heart is in the chest, because that is how the surgeon also sees the heart when the patient is undergoing surgical correction. I hope we've now emphasized again how important it is to use the morphological method to distinguish between what is morphologically right, what is morphologically left, and how, once we have distinguished between the components of the segments, that sets the scene for subsequent sequential analysis when we determine the arrangement with what is going on at the junctions. But most importantly now, by combining the images you've seen produced by Justin using multi-detector computed tomography with the dissections and the hearts that Diane has shown you. I hope you now appreciate that all of these features can be identified just as well during life as when we have the heart in our hands. And as I say, in our next session, we're going to use these rules, to look at the atrial components of the heart, also be looking at the atrioventricular junctions. And then in the final session for this year, just before Christmas, we're going to look at the ventricular mass. So there we are, the basics of clinical cardiac anatomy. Thank you very much, guys. Amazing session. I think this format is going to work very well. I don't know what you guys think about it, but uh, I, I really, I really liked it. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm happy to see that Adrian has joined us. So I think he has some uh, things to show to us. This is correct, Adrian. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Thank you very much. It was really exquisite images from Diane, and I really enjoyed the reconstructions from Justin. Uh, amazing one. So. Prof, thank you again for a wonderful session. I have a few questions and they're hard to show. Uh, hopefully I won't get cold. Uh, first of all, it is indeed difficult that different practitioners working with the heart have different views on it. So you, you'll know that imaging people doing cross-sectional um, procedures, they will see the heart from the bottom up. A surgeons will see the heart from the right side. So the main surgeon will sit on the right side of the patient. Anatomists will see the heart in any position they want because the heart is outside the chest. But I think it's such a great value to be able to do the 3D analysis in your own head. Even if we are not going to convince people to change their uh, topological points, they have to be able to go back to the attitudinally correct position, how the heart sits when we talk among us. I think that's a very I important you point. For just a moment. Can we get Adrian's screen into, uh, in, can we bring Adrian's screen to be the main screen, please? And then, um, um, I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly why it's not coming your as the main one. Because you're, you're using your own video, right? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you and then we can see, but the screen you, you, you are not uh, the, the, main, uh, the main view now. I don't know why. Okay. Adrian, when you're going to share the screen, you need to click on the uh, picture of the heart to get it into the main screen. It's not in the main screen yet. No, I think that uh, uh, is Sasha in charge of uh, manipulating the screens. No, not really. It's it's supposed to be automatic feature of Zoom. Whoever is speaking appears uh, as as uh, the bigger one when you are not sharing your screen. But when Adrian, can you can you try to share your screen? Do you think it's possible? Um, yeah, it's shared. Yes. Okay, and 
let's see if now you can change to your video there. But you're doing this live, right? It's, it's not the way. I haven't done anything different from... Uh, yeah, from the other ones. Yes, I know. It comes before. automatically. Yes, I don't know why it changed. Zoom had, had one uh, upgrade or something like that. And maybe something changed. I'm sorry for that, guys. But okay. now try to stop the share. Maybe you come to the main okay. screen. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Ah, right. Yeah. Well done. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So well, I'll go back to, to the comment. One was indeed the fact that it's difficult to convince different people using everyday different methods, but there is no excuse for whoever works with the heart for not being able to go back to the original correct attitudinally um, the position when describing um, the cardinal points. The second one, Professor Anderson, do you think we will um, get to consider the venous component as a fourth segment of the heart? It's a very good point. I mean, uh, people have uh, suggested we should think of the venous component and we can think of the venoatrial connections as a, a third junction within the heart. I see no reason why we shouldn't do that. Okay, what, one other question is about the terminal crest. What's the relationship in identifying, especially on the CT? It may be easier to identify sometimes a good terminal crest with the extent of the pectinate muscle. What's the link, what's the association between that? I know you, you were part of a study in the past. Well, the, the pectinate muscles extend from the terminal crest to run down uh, to encircle the vestibule. So you are correct, identified because the terminal crest is lacking in the morphologically left atrial appendage. So identification of the terminal crest is also a good marker. Okay, so, um, and one other thing refers the terms that we use to define the pectinate muscle, the extension of the pectinate muscle. We have to stress that if I'm correct, pectinate muscle is confined in both appendages. Correct. It is not that when we say it's confined in the left atrial appendage, people might understand that it's not confined in the right atrial. It is confined. It is the extent and the way the appendage connects with a small body and with a different type of sinus component, the venous component, that gives the impression that pectinate muscle somehow is out of the appendage. It is not out of the right appendage of you the morphologic right. You are entirely correct. And it is the extent of the left, the appendage wall on the right side, as you say, which is the key feature. So the appendage itself encircles the vestibule on the right side. It does not encircle the vestibule on the left side. That's Thank a very you. important point that you have emphasized. On the coronary sinus, people use coronary sinus either referring to the mouth of the coronary sinus, which opens in the right atrium, in the morphologic right atrium, or describing the venous, venous channel in the left atrioventricular junction. So we just have to be careful whenever we discuss the coronary sinus, what exactly we mean by that. Well, indeed, you will note that when I described what was going on, I called it the venous channel yeah. rather than the coronary sinus. But it is, in a, is a, I mean, we could, part of it will be the great cardiac vein, but it is the presence of the venous channel that tells us we are dealing with the morphologically left, left junction. Yes. And in the end, I'd like to show a heart, which is quite intriguing because uh, I hope everybody can see this heart is positioned like it will be in the chest. Uh, there is uh, the dissection that was done in the uh, ventricular components, as you see here, and the great arteries. I won't mm -hmm. go into the details. Um, as you see, the two lungs, it's a heart and lung block. I will concentrate on the right, the, the atrium that is on the right side, and you can see from outside here, this is how it looks. And you will think this is a broad-based, triangular, relatively triangular-shaped um, atrium um, appendage. And if I look at the left side of the heart, which is here, and you can see how the left appendage looks like, I will zoom in. This is the left appendage, which is here. And you think that this is some sort of a finger-like appendage on the left side? Or, mm -hmm. uh, or anyway, it will not look like a triangular shape typical for a morphologic right appendage. So. 
In this, looking at the exterior aspect of the appendages, one could say that this looks like a morphologic right appendage located on the right side and the morphologic left appendage located on the left side. I'll turn the heart back. I'll look from the back of the heart. So this will be the appendage that is located on the right side, the one with broad base, as you see here. And when I look inside, the pectinate muscle is confined, as we say, inside the appendage, but has no weight and it doesn't arrive in the vestibule part. It's all inside there, as you can see. It. If I look on this appendage, which is located on the left side, that one that looks like a morphologic left, and if I open this appendage, look, pectinate muscle all around the vestibule on the left side. So my word of caution, and of course, when I look at the heart from the back, you'll see that this is really a mirror image arrangement because this is the right bronchus on the left, the one that is oblique and short, and this is the left main bronchus, but also the lobation of the lungs. You'll see that on this lung, there are three fissures. On this lung, there are only two fissures. I'll turn the heart back to show you better that. So on this side, I have three fissures of the lungs, one, two, three, and on the left side, on this lung, I only have two fissures, bilobe lung on the right side. So that appendage that we thought from outside that it may be a right one is actually a left one and vice versa on the left side on this one. So it's a mirror image. When we get to CCTGA, this is actually a double discordant connections heart, very interesting. But I just wanted to show that, especially for surgeons, this is especially for surgeons because they are used to describe appendages by looking from outside. And then if you not dissect, if you not incise the atrium, you'll never be 100% sure what kind of morphology of the appendage is. And when we look on the right side of the appendage, because that's the, the atrium that mostly we dissect, we have to look for the coronary sinus mouth and for the terminal crest from inside. That's all I wanted to say, thank crest? you. Can you see the terminal crest in this heart, um, Adrian? Uh, yes, on the right side. The left, the morpho on the left, it's actually left-sided. Yeah. yeah, on the left side, wh where is the morphologic right? Right, it's there here. It there it is. Because it also has a superior caval vein on it this is. side. That so, is an amazing heart, yes. Adrian. And it yes, you see how nicely it inserts on this Absolutely. terminal crest. I think that's, uh, that heart really, uh, Bob, should be part of your permanent collection of argument because- We can't see you, how... Norman. You, Pardon? You, we can't see you. Have you got your video? I have. They won't let me in. I've tried to, to get on. Okay. And it says unable to start the video. So Grace has to let me in, but otherwise I'm here in blank form and um, well, I'm not that perfect you. to look at anyway. We can hear you. So uh, the, I think that the, the point about the um, terminal crest is vital. I've been looking at this now uh, in many fetal hearts and even from the fetus, you can see the terminal crest. And I think the terminal crest is still part of the a real appendage morphology. And so uh, you can look at right and left appendages and see bilateral right appendages, uh, 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 bilateral um, uh, terminal crests in right isomerism and the absence of the terminal crest in either atrium in left isomerism. And I think that's an important indication. And, um, you know, I think that uh, can be highlighted both by morphology, echocardiography, as well as uh, by the um, uh, radiological uh, tomographic methods of MRI or CT. Absolutely. So, so I think that that's, that's an important thing. And of course, I'm looking at, um, at, uh, at, at, at the heart as a, from an echocardiographic standpoint. And uh, I, I don't know how big the hearts are that you looked at, uh, Justin. I don't know whether yeah, Justin's still with Justin us. Justin is not with us, unfortunately. So uh, 
But, he has a very busy day on Fridays, so we pre-recorded all Justin's material. So he's not with us today, but Diane is with us and Adrian is with us. Well, I, I think that so it's very hard to see um, pectinate muscles most of the time from surface echocardiography. Well, of course, if you go and do the, um, uh, the uh, intravascular or the transesophageal, you can see it. And now, of course, um, the left atrium has become the focus of ultrasound for the point of view of uh, the fact that depending on the shape of the um, atrial appendage, the chances of getting uh, embolus and atrial fibrillation is much greater with certain morphological shapes than with others. So I think that uh, we have to uh, start looking at, um, at uh, really the um, pectinate um, muscles uh, a little more clearly, as well as the terminal crest. The other issue that I think that is important to bring up that uh, perhaps is uh, subtle and is not really appreciated is the uh, issue of the septomarginal trabeculation. It's obviously easy to see on morphological method. But uh, I think on echocardiogram, you can often see the, um, the um, septum marginal trabeculation as it runs on the septum, because there's often a demarcation within the musculature which separates the um, septum marginal trabeculation from the rest of the septum. And indeed, it's one of the reasons we get septal hypertrophy. Also in chronic right ventricular dilatation, the septomarginal trabeculation is lifted off the rest of the septum and appears as a freestanding structure. So I think that uh, that's one of the things that uh, I looked at uh, on the CT scan that uh, Justin showed that was really quite clear but um, not that easy to identify and perhaps is easier to identify on the basis of echocardiography. And the one question I wanted to ask Justin is that the heart that he showed was from a fairly large patient and not a small patient, because I think that in the pediatric uh, world, it becomes a little bit more difficult to see the trabecular pattern on ultrasound within the atrial appendages uh, than uh, you can see with the other morphological technologies. Well, Justin is not here to answer for himself, but uh, maybe he will uh, be able to respond to that. We can go we, next when we come back. We can. Uh, so I, I'd like to ask him, you know, how big are the hearts that he looks at? Because a big heart, it's much easier to see the trabeculations than in a small heart. Well, we're going to be discussing, uh, he will be, when we move on into our session before Christmas, when we focus on the ventricles, we can ask him to discuss that. Oh, we can see you now. Yes, well, now it says start my video. So I well, there said, we are. They're welcome. Okay. I've I been thought, all the time listening. Good to see you. I'm not, I'm not sure it's an improvement, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sure it is, Bob. I'm sure it is. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. You're a lady and Bob isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, very nice session. I think very clear. And um, again, I think that um, I always like to emphasize this for the Congenital Heart Academy is that all of the videos are available on the YouTube site. And um, I always go back and look at the sessions. Uh, to see what I've missed uh, when I, I do them again. And of course, uh, the pictures are there for everyone uh, to uh, garner as they wish. Okay, right. we, don't have, we don't have any question on the Q&A showing that was a very clear explanation. We and now, Grace, we can only see Grace Van Leeuwen. I don't know what my, my internet, I'm outside on the balcony enjoying the, the, the evening and uh, my internet is not the best here outside. Right, Diane, do you have any comments to make? I think your demonstrations today were spectacular and uh, they fitted so well with what we saw from, from Justin. So uh, the, the one last point. Thanks, Bob. 
the one last point, I don't know whether Adrian's gone back to his ECMO patient, but uh, the thing about that heart that was a bit of a kicker that he showed is that there was levocardia with the, with the, where you would expect if it was pure situs and versus that it might be uh, with dextrocardia and yet it was still levocardia. Uh, have you got anything to say about that, Adrian? So um, the only thing I can say is that it was um, <laughs> apex pointing to the right. Um, if you look oh. at the heart, how it sits, I don't have the full chest anymore. On the post-mortem, it was described of, um, as a right. I don't want to say dextrocardia because Prof will, will suppress we, me. We, we don't uh, want to get into it. Exactly. Heart, heart, heart in the right chest <laughs> on the <laughs> post-mortem. Thank you. <laughs> Very easy to understand English, you know. <laughs> Apex is definitely pointing to the right. Yeah, okay, all right, because uh, that wasn't clear the way you put it. It did look like it was sort of like uh, almost in a Valentine it position was. as you showed it. And I agree, I no. agree with that. But, but the whole point is that the apex, the position of the heart the and the direction of the apex tell us nothing. We know no. full well that with a normal heart, you can have a normal <laughs> heart in the left chest, in the right chest rather with the apex pointing to the right. All that we need to do is to describe the cardiac position. Yes, correct. I'll, I'll show the heart again when we do the congenitally corrected transposition in more detail, because it no, has other interesting see. features as well. I thought yeah. I could see the vessels weren't quite uh, as you would expect. Yes, yes. But it is, it is a fascinating heart, and it makes the point that Richard Van Prague made a long time ago, that you cannot depend on the shape of the appendages to distinguish between them. And Richard suggested that because of that, we couldn't distinguish between them. But in fact, as Adrian has shown us, when we look inside, and the point you've now made, Norman, when we take into account the terminal crest, the features are there that permit us to distinguish when we look at the appendage, between what is morphologically right and what is morphologically left. So Bob, one last point uh, for me, uh, thank you for that, is um, the um, argument of Dr. Van Prague that the uh, chamber that receives the inferior vena cava, uh, or at least the supra um, uh, hepatic portion of the inferior vena cava is the right atrium, is also violated many times because uh Yes, yes, you want to carry on, Bob. No, it, you're right. And uh, I mean, it's paradoxical in this regard that Richard pinned us to the wall when he drew attention to the fact that we weren't using the morphological method when we were defining ventricles. Yet when <laughs> it comes to the atrial chambers, having defined the morphological method, he then ignores it and says that the venous channels distinguish the atrial chambers. And as Diane showed you beautifully, that is not the case. Yeah, right. I just thought that was a point worthwhile making. Indeed. Grace, do we have no questions at all? No questions today. It was a very clear uh, session. And uh, as we had uh, started this new uh, approach, I think uh, this is going to be even clearer. I think. Uh, it was a very nice uh, uh, way to to show the information, Bob. I, I, I'm waiting to, to see the feedback. Guys, you're all going to receive our SurveyMonkey uh, feedback survey. Please fill it for us and let us know uh, how do you feel about this new format. It's going to be important for us to carry on. But personally, I really appreciate I think it was beautiful. I mean, Grace, that is a very important point you've just made. I didn't realize you ha were able to get a SurveyMonkey because the feedback is going to be absolutely key because if things go go well and certainly the next two sessions before Christmas will be done in exactly the same fashion. Diane will be preparing the video clips. Justin will be supplementing them with CT. We hope Adrian will be able to join us. He's managed to escape from the intensive care unit to be with us today. And then Adrian will reinforce as he has done today the discussions we have during the session and he'll be with us live. So it is very important because when we start in 2022, we hope to extend these sessions to consider all the lesions. So it's very important that we get the feedback. 
When, when sure. are the next two sessions, please, um, uh, Grace? It's, uh, <coughs> the dates. Sorry, December the 3rd and December the 17th. Oh. We know where you're going to be on December the 3rd, Norman. So uh, At least I'll be with you, Bob. You will indeed. We welcome you. Maybe to I can join you in your living room. Well, <laughs> I think you're doing something else on the Friday, but on the Saturday, we look forward to seeing you. Great. That looks terrific. I'm looking forward to that very much. So I would like to thank in particular Sasha, who put all the things together today. I think it worked remarkably well. <clears throat> I was worried as to how it was all going to come together, but I think it really did work well. And for me, I think it was a great session. Uh, so. Please, everybody let Grace give her your feedback and uh, we wait to hear from you. And Diane also, thank you for those spectacular dissections. Absolutely, that you did. Diane Stella. And we hope that uh, you'll be able to do the same thing for two weeks time and then again for the ventricles. We will. Hey, Q, hey, Q how's Q? Hey, Q. Good to see you, Bob. And you too, how are you? Doing well, doing very well, thank you. Looking forward to the next season here. Indeed, uh, I hope you're, you're suitably satisfied by everything that Diane is doing and bringing, your, bringing all children to the fore again. No, she's, she's, <laughs> doing, she's doing great work. And uh, yeah, it just, uh, I can I just can continue to be amazed at every presentation. It's just the clearest I've ever seen it done, you know, just great. I agree with you there. I think we're we're really charting new territory, and I think I agree with you. The clarity we achieved today was spectacular. I agree. <clears throat> so thank you very much, guys. It was an amazing session. Can't wait for the next one. And hope to see you all on our journal club on Tuesday, the 23rd. Thank you, guys. And great, okay, thank great. You. Yes, Grace, yes. You, you have to sort out this business with Zoom because we all we see at the moment is your name and we need to see your smiling face. <laughs> this is true. It's my internet connection. It's going to be better next time, hopefully. Sort it all out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Thank it was an amazing session. See you guys Tuesday.